Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, how you all doing? I'm really happy to be here today. I, I love this conference. I love GESF, um, and I love being in Dubai. Um, and I feel really honored to actually share the stage with George and, and, and Wendy, because they really both do exceptional things. And I'll be honest that I'm, I'm, a little, uh, I'm a little intimidated to be on the stage with them. But I have this idea that I, I'm going to calm my nerves by playing a little game. Okay, We're all going to play a game together. Don't worry. You're not going to have to stand up or do anything. Right? But games are fun, so they're a little relaxing, and, uh, and they're playful. Um, and, and I thought we should play. Um, Play is one of the answers to the how question, right? And that's what we're interested in here. How do we unleash sustainable innovation for education? And one of the ways we're going to do it is through play. Um, so let's start with what is play. And we should define the word play, right? Because we all use it a lot, but we rarely think about it in detail. Although our friends at Lego do think about it in detail. Um, and so I'm going to use their definition. And their definition is play to play is to engage. When we play, we pick up objects, ideas, or themes, and we do whatever we want with them. We turn them upside down, and we experiment with them. So let's play. We're going to play a game. And if you, I mean, you, you just heard a little bit about me, but if you know anything about me already, or if, you, or if you've read my bio, or you've read my writing on Forbes, you know that, that I write and I speak about video games. I've been doing this for a few years. It's, this is my area of expertise. It's educational video games, video games in schools, interactive technologies, learning games, digital media. I write about this. I speak about this. Do you all know that a billion and a half people all play video games of some sort? That's 20% of the world's population, actually more than 20%. And what that should tell us is that video games are now just a part of life, right? They've become more than leisure and entertainment. They're now mainstream media. They, they are, they're now an everyday form of storytelling, of representation. They've become a form of rhetoric for the 21st century. And because of this, we should not be surprised at all that educators and policymakers and investors and developers are all trying to build games for schools. Game-based learning, that's what we call it. That's the jargon, right? Game-based learning. Game-based learning is popular because video games are not only really effective teachers, they, they are also relatively inexpensive to build and to distribute. And what that means is that they're scalable and replicable and extensible and all of those buzzwords that philanthropists and venture capitalists and policymakers all like to hear, right? Phrases like sustainable innovation. And of course, that's the topic of this session, unleashing sustainable innovation, which is an oxymoron, right? If you really think about it, it doesn't make any sense. Right? There's nothing sustainable about endless disruption and reinvention and growth. What happens is things get out of control or they get unleashed, right? But it sounds good. Unleashing sustainable innovation sounds convincing. And video games have a lot going for them in a world where, where terms like these are used to describe the criteria we're looking for. So we're going to focus on games. And we're going to call them sustainable innovation for education. And we're going to play with these words. Okay? We're going to explore them together. And we're going to do it by playing a game. And it's a simple game. It's a role-playing game. RPG is what we call a role-playing game in video game speak. Okay? RPG. And the RPG that we're going to play today works this way. It's really simple. I'm going to stand here on this stage. And I'm going to pretend that I'm an expert. I'm going to pretend that I'm an authority on education and game-based learning. And you. You sit there and you pretend you're conference attendees, okay? Or, or, or maybe you're watching it on video or something later. Either way, you're going to take on this role of enthusiastic audience members. You're going to be engaged and interested and thoughtful and attentive. Real simple. You don't have to do much. You all know how this works. You've done this lots of times, I'm assuming. But as we start, what I want you to do is I want you to really think about your role. Think about the role that you're playing here. Think about it in much more depth than you usually do. And think about how you fit into this context. Think about what this context actually is. Right? Be really mindful of this kind of interactive pursuit that we're engaged in together right now. Because it's a game. It's a system. It's got a certain set of rules, certain, some components, some objectives. Right? And they're all rules that we've played before. They're all components we're experienced with. We've all been playing games just like this for many, many years because we're taught to play games like this in school. Education usually works in almost the same way, like a game. 
teachers and students participating together in an interactive structure, playing by a certain set of rules. There's a reward system and prizes and achievements and levels and obstacles and tests and trials and scores. But students rarely think of education as a game and neither do teachers. In fact, few people think of it as play. We usually think of this as work because oddly, thinking of education as play turns out to be a pretty disruptive perspective, right? It disrupts our habitual patterns, patterns that have been sustained for a really long time. When I started my semester teaching at Temple University, the current semester that I'm teaching, I told all my students exactly what I just told you, right? About class being a game and that education was a kind of play, an RPG. And what they did was they all giggled uncomfortably because it was disorienting, because they're not used to looking at the learning process in this way, right? It makes them uncomfortable. It's a little too meta for them, right? Meta, that's the kind of casual language that my students use. Nobody says that's deep anymore, right? They, they, they say meta, right? That's the, that's the slang, meta. And I think it's a good choice of words when I think of it, actually, because meta comes from the Greek, and it means beyond or above or outside, but in ancient Roman times, and this is actually really fascinating, in ancient Roman times, meta was an architectural term. It signified the outer boundary of a circus, like the Circus Maximus or the Colosseum. The meta was made up of columns, and it was the boundary of the place where games took place. Okay, Games like chariot races. The meta marked the boundaries of the race course, which they called a curricle, right, or a curriculum. I'm not making this up. This is where the word curriculum comes from. Okay. Everything comes together when you start playing with words, right? Because literacy, as we all know, is a really powerful thing. And it's about a lot more than just the basic skills involved with alphanumeric symbols, right? It's, it's about being able to play with words. OK, we're playing with the word meta, which in modern educational psychology, you're going to see the word meta the most with the term metacognition. And metacognition describes the ability to think about your own thinking, to have an awareness or an understanding of your own thought processes, to have some autonomy or control in your own intellectual capacity, to be a reflective observer of yourself, which matters. It matters to us here at this conference because metacognitive functions lead to good academic skills. Right? Through metacognitive functions, learners learn to recognize their own strengths and weaknesses. They learn to adapt and iterate their performance because academia works like a video game. It's something students play again and again. They practice and they improve. But for now, what I want you to do is I want you to think of metacognition just as the ability to step outside the boundary of your everyday Circus Maximus, your everyday Colosseum, right? Think of it as the ability to see the ongoing curriculum of your life from outside, as if through a window, right? Or through the bezel of a computer screen or a gaming console. Metacognitive functions let you look back from outside the boundaries of your own thinking, the boundaries of all your relationships, the boundaries of all your interactions. You get to see the interactive game in which you're participating at any given moment. Now, this is really easy to do when you play a video game. That's why they're such good teaching tools, right? And I don't need, to make you understand this, I don't need any fancy terms. All you have to do is think about the avatar or the game, the character you are in the game. In the game, there are always two eyes. There's the eye who's holding the controller, and then there's the eye that's moving within the meta boundary of the game itself, the eye that's in the game. Right? There's this metacognitive distance built right into every, to every video game. But this is not only true of video games. You don't need fancy lab, laptops or tablets to do this. It's really just about imaginative play, right? which is why people have been using play therapy for more than a century. Right? The Kleinians and the Jungians with their sandboxes and their mandalas and their little t menageries of toys. Right? They have always known that games and play strengthen metacognitive functions, and they've always known that as long as you have the guidance of a great mentor or a therapist or a teacher, right, they'll help you learn to recognize your own context, to recognize the structures, the systems, and the economies in which you're a participant. In other words, metacognitive functions enable individuals to recognize the games they're playing, but they're not just playing them. They're creating the game. They're creating the game in the same way that we are creating this game, that we, we created this game that we're playing right now because we all agreed to abide by the rules of a conference presentation, right? 
Now, we're all aware of the rules. We're all aware of the game that we're playing. We're all aware of these meta boundaries. We see them all clearly, and therefore, we know we made the choice to play. And what that means is we're empowered. And what that means is that we have dignity. And dignity is a concept that we should think of as the ability to innovate, because being innovative should really be thought of as the ability to change the games in the ways that suit you, in the ways that suit us, right? In the ways that can better sustain us. Or maybe we just want to switch the game, games altogether, but we want to be empowered to do such a thing, right? That's the most important thing that students learn from schools and educators who understand what playful education is. The students are learning how to recognize and iterate and imagine and build and play with really complex systems. They're, right, they're gaining the ability to innovate, which is a basic prerequisite to human dignity. Right? And I've seen this firsthand when kids pick up an iPad and play a game like Dragon Box, for example, which takes the power of interactive digital multimedia to show students the basic algebra and Euclidean geometry, just games, just simple games with simple rules and components and objectives and puzzles. I've seen this in a school, I mean many schools, but the one that comes immediately to mind is New York City's Quest to Learn School, which has no more digital technology than any other average school in New York City, right? But it still uses these principles of game design as a framework for inquiry, right? A framework that students and teachers apply to everything they do, right? They identify games and systems in an interdisciplinary way across the curriculum. Playful games and organizations like these teach students how to leverage traditional academic content, how to leverage literacy skills, STEM skills, critical thinking skills, fine arts, music, and performance skills. Students learn how to leverage all of these things for innovation, for human dignity. They're taught the skills they need to recognize and to create their own games their own meta boundaries, right? They're empowered because they've learned how to relate to the world. They've learned how to play. They've learned new ways to pick things up, turn them upside down, and experiment with them, which in turn unleashes sustainable innovation, right? Because sustainable innovation, with the real sustainable innovation we want to unleash is the students themselves. Thank you. Thank you.